Um, yeah, so I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Diana Sally, another one from the Snow and Avalanche Lab at Montana State University, and I'm going to talk about using time-lapse photography to study skiers in backcountry avalanche terrain. So winter recreation and backcountry avalanche terrain has noticeably increased in recent years. Um, in popular areas, the backcountry snowpack can look a lot like a controlled ski area. And forecasting for large areas with different usage patterns can provide challenging for avalanche forecasters. So to create a better forecast, we need a better idea of how people move in the backcountry. See if this works. Oh, sweet. Um, so in this project, we're considering how people move through avalanche terrain. What does high use terrain look like? Where are these people going? Does line choice change with conditions or previous tracks? Um, can we use this knowledge to assist in avalanche forecasting? And can we do it with a camera? So to gain some understanding of how skiers play in the backcountry, I used a time-lapse camera to capture skiers moving through avalanche terrain. In this way, a series of pictures can document a day of skier locations on a slope, as the red dots in the picture show. Um, for this, I needed a slope with three main features. Uncontrolled avalanche terrain with a large user group, uh, an ideal location for a camera to focus on that terrain, and ideally, a history of avalanche activity. Um, so enter Saddle Peak. Saddle Peak is directly south of the Bridger Bowl ski area in southwest Montana's Gallatin National Forest. Um, it's accessed by riding uh, lifts within the Bridger Bowl ski area and exiting at the south boundary line. From the boundary line at Ridgetop, many skiers descend the football field. Um, others continue the hike to the, others continue hiking up the ridge to peak, which takes about 30 to 40 minutes. So the popular ski terrain is highly visible from the ski area and faces east. Prevailing winds come from the west and wind loading and cornices are frequent. Um, as well, it has a high exposure factor. The entire feature is broken mid-track mid by large cliffs upward of 200 feet. So Saddle Peak on the left side, or sorry, the right side of the photo, your left, um, looking north towards the Bridger Bowl Sea area. So this is a popular backcountry slope that is skied often and under a variety of avalanche conditions. So with the help of Bridger Bowl Ski Patrol, a camera was installed on an unused gun platform. A uh, Canon digital SLR camera was focused on Saddle Peak and programmed to take one photo every 10 seconds between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. The camera captured a large portion of the east side of Saddle Peak from the ridge top to the lowest traverse back into the boundary. The study area is identified with the dashed red outline. Um, the resolution of the images made tracking and identifying individual skiers possible, but not detailed enough to pick up any distinguishing characteristics. They look like tiny black dots. So along with high use avalanche train and an optimal camera location, Saddle Peak also manages to produce a few avalanches every winter. Uh, in southwest Montana's Bridge Range, um, cold temperatures can quickly produce a strong temperature gradient within the snowpack, and it's not uncommon to have a weak basal facet layer and dense wind slab making up the snowpack structure. And the Saddle Peak area consistently gives us a couple avalanches other seasons. So the largest event in recent history occurred on Tuesday, February 16th, 2010. Um, a recent storm had deposited 30 inches of new snow with strong winds, and during the storm, the lifts accessing the train had been closed and were reopened Tuesday morning. So late, oh, can we just go back one? Sorry, thank you. So late in the morning, a skier cut a chunk of cornice from the ridge. It rolled down slope about 100 feet and initiated an avalanche approximately 1,000 feet wide, um, to, ran 2,000 feet, and left a crown four to six feet deep. So it was a pretty big avalanche. Um, at the time, 20 to 30 people were hiking the ridge, and several people were already, had already skied the slope. So the avalanche was captured by several different people in many locations, and fortunately, no one was involved. But it highlights the potential for a catastrophic avalanche to occur here. So between the 2010 avalanche and the end of last season, um, I found Photographs documenting 11 other avalanche events that occurred around Saddle Peak, either on the football field or on Saddle Peak's north or south bowls. And notably, Saddle South Bowl produces avalanches every year. Um, so a quick summary of the events which involve people. 
So February 2012, a skier triggered an avalanche in Saddle Peak South Bowl. The skier was carried 2,000 feet down slope and partially buried and injured. Two days later, the North Bowl of Saddle Peak avalanche naturally with a crown three to five feet deep and propagated a couple hundred feet across the slope. Uh, December 2013, the football field was triggered by ski patrol, reporting a failure deep within the snowpack. Then in January, the football field ran again, failing sympathetically with inbounds avalanche control operations. And December 20, 2015, the football field was intentionally triggered by Bridger Bowl Ski Patrol, running 100 feet wide, 4 feet deep, and failing on basal facets. And then a month later, in January 2015, the football field was triggered by skiing public. Um, this avalanche was 200 feet wide with a two-foot crown and ran 1,500 feet. Um, it was a close call and there was no involvement. This was our first camera season and the camera captured the event and we'll come back to these avalanches in just a bit. So essentially, I put up a camera and took a lot of pictures of people skiing. So let's take a look at what a day of skiing looks like. Um, Sunday, February 14th was a mostly sunny day with good visibility in the bridge range. Six to eight inches of snow had fallen in the past 24 hours, and they were accompanied with moderate southerly winds. The avalanche hazard was forecasted at considerable on all slopes steeper than 35 degrees with a dense and stubborn wind slab as the primary avalanche concern. Oh. Cool. So this video will show a selection of skier lines from that day, February 14th, 2016. can be a little entertaining, but, oh, thank you. Um, so to pull terrain metrics from those oblique photos, I essentially have to geo-reference our skier points onto a DEM. So how to do that? From the oblique photo that I took with the camera, um, I digitized the skier points and then also found a bunch of ground control points, which are the red circles, um, and identified them in both the oblique photo as well as the DEM. And then using a transformation process, the skier points from the oblique photo are geo-referenced onto the DEM. The DEM is what provides us with terrain information. So from that, every skier point can be assigned a location, an elevation, we can find out what kind of slope they're on, that sort of thing. So for example, uh, this is a view of Saddle Peak from Google Earth. Yeah. Um, and from our oblique photos and transformations, we'll identify skier tracks and use the digital elevation model to identify slope angles in the terrain. There we go. So here the black lines are skier tracks and the color co colors correspond to different slope angles, green's low angle terrain, um, steep terrain, terrain is identified in red, red, excuse me, such as the cliffs mid track. Um, so with this, we can identify terrain information like where a skier was in terrain greater than 30 degrees or what the total average slope angle skied for a day is, for example. So the oblique photograph here with the red dots is georeferenced to the DEM and the grayscale background with the color dots represents slope steepness. 
So this image gives us the slope angle for every skier point on February 14th, 2016, with an average slope angle skied of 26 degrees. And from there, we can compare other days against that. So March 27th, 2016 was a spring Sunday. The weather was okay. Increasing cloud and incoming weather and lots of previous skier tracks. And as I found out later, pretty much the only group skiing Saddle Peak that day was a bunch of locals. So this shows the slope angles for skier points on February 14th and March 27th, 2016. And the locals in March avoided the football field and skied what's considered the safe line from the peak. Um, they posted a slightly steeper average angle than the February skiers and as well when the March local skiers skied, they skied much faster and more direct, but they also took more breaks and regrouped more often. And perhaps this is because they knew the terrain they were in and they knew the groups they were with they were more familiar with it. All right, so, so if you can remember our quick Saddle, Saddle Peak Avalanche, Avalanche history from earlier, uh, we'll, we'll go back to January 14th, 2016, 2016 a skier triggered avalanche on the football field. So on January 14th, 2016, the bridge range received four to six inches of new snow overnight and another two to three inches forecasted through the day. Uh, avalanche hazard was considerable on all wind loaded slopes. Yeah, there we go. Avalanche hazard was considerable on all wind loaded slopes and the primary avalanche concern was wind slab with basal depth or and facets. Uh, late in the morning, an avalanche on the football field was triggered by skiers and we captured the event. So, oh, go back, did it play? Maybe. <laughs> we'll see if it plays. Anyways, we'll get up a video here and uh, we're going to run through the event starting with about an hour prior. Hopefully it comes up. Sorry about that, guys. If it helps, this is on YouTube, so you guys can all just flash it up really quick and <laughs> we'll just go from there. <laughs> there we go. Cool, so starting at 10.47 a.m., um, we're gonna see the first Saddle Peak skiers of the day captured on the ridge top. And I don't think this one has sound, so you'll have to listen to me talk. So we captured a total of 11 skiers that day. I think it's getting going. Nice. Yeah, so 10.47 a.m. we'll see the first skiers and we captured a total of 11 um, skiing that terrain prior to the avalanche occurring. Um, unfortunately, at times, a layer of cloud will obscure the ridge intermittently, so here it gets going. Um, so all skiers are identified when they become visible. Um, they're all descending the ridge. So this is prior to the avalanche and the time frame at the bottom. So this red skier is going to finish his line and two skiers will appear on. Sorry, the next red skier. There we go. And those two skiers appear in the same frame of the avalanche. Three skiers right now are going to be captured descending adjacent to the avalanche, pulling back to the ski hill. And just after them, we'll replay it for you. So back to our red skier, our group of two will appear, followed by other group of two and the avalanche. So these guys are pretty close. They remotely triggered it. Uh, that's just a collection of all the skier tracks from that day. Uh, you'll note that we don't have anything above cutting over above the avalanche crown. We couldn't see anything. It's very possible that skiers went that way. Um, as well, later in the afternoon, forecasters from the avalanche center went to assess the crown and documented tracks going right into the middle of it. So, Back to our slide. We just got a couple of pictures after the event. We'll just catch up here. Perfect. 
So a couple of pictures from after the event, one looking back uphill, and then the other is of the forecasters performing that crown pro profile. Um, as for the response, I was actually on my way to check the camera when the avalanche occurred, and I ended up meeting up with Doug Richmond, patrol director at Bridger Bowl. There we go. Um, who was coordinating the avalanche rescue response, and we actually pulled out the memory card from the camera and used it to assist with the response and help determine that these people were not involved. Um, so it was really excellent use of the camera, not for what we planned, but it was really nice to see that outcome. So without much effort, our camera captured an avalanche event, and from what we just watched, the photos can assist us with determining skier locations relative to a crown and avalanche, and perhaps even determine involvement. We also developed a way to study skiers moving through avalanche terrain, um, but we can get a lot more other information from time-lapse photography. Um, so we can use it to compare similar avalanches. So from our Saddle Peak avalanche history, I digitized the crown lines I found of avalanches in the Saddle Peak area for the last six seasons. And this is a top-down view, so similar to our DEM, or what we would use. Um, so using a similar process as georeferencing skier points, I georeferenced the crown lines. Um, to let us see where avalanches occur over time. So we'll start by highlighting two avalanches. The first is the football field avalanche captured by the camera. And the December 20th avalanche, which was triggered by ski patrol about a month prior. Um, or we can look back to the February 2012 avalanche, which was in Saddle South Bowl, which resulted in injury. The skier went for the ride. And then two days later, Two days later, a natural avalanche in the North Bowl, or just overall, we can isolate all the skier-triggered avalanches in the Saddle Peak area. So just different ways of using this photography. So time-lapse photography is a really powerful tool in both avalanche research and rescue response. Um, it's a simple and inexpensive method to document skier usage in avalanche terrain, and these images can assist us with determining avalanche triggers, the number of people involved, and provide a last scene point. As well, time-lapse images provide value information on avalanche train usage and create an avalanche history for high use areas in the backcountry. So that's currently what I'm working on at MSU. I'm still crunching a whole lot of data and working through the numbers, but there's a lot of potential applications for this sort of research. Thanks for listening, and does anyone have any questions? <laughs>